Yeah, you can start uh, to barely. Thank you, Professor Wiley. So um, it's my great pleasure to uh, to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Leon Feldman. Dr. Feldman, as you know, is the uh, head of our department. She's the reason you're in the best department uh, at McGill. So um, Dr. Feldman is the Edward Archibald Professor and Chair in the department here and the Surgeon in Chief at McGill University Health Center. You all have her bio, so I will just focus on the, on the key points. Her clinical focus is on uh, minimally invasive gastrointestinal surgery. And her research program focuses on proving quality of patient recovery after abdominal surgery, optimization of the perioperative care processes, and technology-enabled assessment and improvement of operative performance. Her work is internationally recognized <clears throat> um, uh, in the field of enhanced recovery after surgery, otherwise known as ERAS, and the ERAS program at McGill University Health Center under her leadership was recognized as a leading practice by Accreditation Canada such that uh, she's been contracted by the Quebec Health Ministry to uh, support prov provincial-wide implementation. She's a past president of the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, otherwise known as SAGES, and is a member of the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons. Um, she's one of the busiest people in the department and also one of the most prolific in terms of research. She's the author of over 300 articles, books, chapters, and videos, and co-editor of three books, including the SAGES ERAS Society Manual on Enhanced Recovery for Gastrointestinal Surgery. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk, Dr. Feldman. Thank you, uh, Professor Barrelet. I really appreciate that very kind introduction and uh, the opportunity to speak to our amazing uh, students in our surgical and interventional sciences program. Um, so it's a Zoom thing. So if uh, I won't necessarily see your questions in the chat. So if there are questions, um, uh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, take some time to answer them later. Uh, so what I want to talk about is a little bit what um, Professor Barrelet mentioned, ERAS, or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. And I want to talk mostly about the R in ERAS, recovery, and what that um, and, and what the meaning of recovery after surgery is. Um, and I want to give a little bit of a focus on what's coming up in this, uh, in this, in this um, field. Um, so I don't have any financial disclosures. I do have a lot of acknowledgements, but a lot of them, my, my main acknowledgement is that you're going to see a, a bunch of work uh, that has taken place over the last 15 years or so. And uh, almost all of it was done by students in uh, experimental surgery. Um, and I will, uh, I'll call them out um, as, as I present uh, their work. So um, what I'd like to go through with you in the next 45 minutes or so is a question that uh, I've been interested in um, really since I started in surgery, so maybe 30 years, which is why does it take so long to recover after an operation? And really a little bit of, in order to answer that question, we need to be able to define what we mean by recovering after, by recovering, by recovery after surgery, and then find, uh, figure out how to measure it, and then uh, ways to improve it. Um, and uh, the idea of the improving patient recovery is really at the center of the work in what's called ERAS, or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Programs, and I'll explain what those are, uh, because it's pretty simple. They're clinical care pathways, as I'll explain. But really, it's, to me, um, a culture change in the way that we organize uh, how we deliver surgery to patients. And uh, I hope I will explain that a little bit. And I'll explain how we got started at, at our hospital and where and some of our results. And then I want to finish off with a little bit of what's on the horizon. So ERAS 2.0, 3.0, maybe I don't know what number we're on now, but some of the areas where I think that we are working on a little bit more now and where there's uh, some interest and excitement. So that's what I'm going to try to cover. 
So, you know, big pictures of big, nasty operations has to be the first slide in uh, most, um, you know, presentations about surgery. So hopefully that doesn't, I hope maybe wakes you up a bit after lunch or hopefully doesn't interfere with your lunch, but you're all, you know, in the Department of Surgery. So, you know, that's, uh, those are the pictures. But basically, you know, these are pictures of surgery that are uh, you, big operations that are used to treat patients with gastric and uh, esophageal uh, cancer. And, you know, that's a pretty invasive uh, traumatic type of intervention, but for many diseases, like for cancer, um, surgery provides the biggest chance for a cure and the opportunity to provide durable results for many types of diseases. But there's a cost, there's a cost to surgery. And the cost has to do with uh, the metabolic uh, response to surgery. So any trauma um, and surgery included uh, induces uh, a metabolic or a stress response, which is mediated by these afferent sensory nerves and cytokines that are generated from the site of injury. And the net effect of this stress response is increased secretion of um, catabolic hormones, uh, including uh, cortisol, uh, ADH, catecholamines. And the point of that is to provide food substrates from the catabolism of carbohydrate, fat, and protein and to maintain plasma volume. And you could see how that would probably be an evolutionary advantage for an injured animal who has to kind of crawl to the back of the cave and catabolize its own tissues. But um, whether we need uh, this anymore um, in, in the kind of trauma that we're talking about is a, is, is, is a question uh, we can discuss. But what's important to understand is that the extent uh, to which the stress response and this metabolic response is evoked parallels the degree of tissue injury. So a little bit of tissue injury, not so much response, and a lot of tissue injury, a big response. And insulin resistance is the hallmark uh, uh, of the stress response. And that's why it's been called uh, the diabetes of, of, in, of surge, or the diabetes of injury. And this, uh, this uh, and hyperglycemia, both hyperglycemia and insulin resistance. Uh, there is from increased glucose production from uh, glycogenolysis and uh, glu um, gluconeogenesis, uh, so breakdown of um, of uh, of um, a glycogen uh, in the in the liver, uh, which is driven by cortisol and catecholamines. But there's also peripheral insulin resistance, um, which uh, is a result of decreased uh, uptake of glucose. So that's uh, the metabolic response uh, to surgery. So, uh, so surgeons, you know, see the impact of this uh, metabolic response every day. And if you, if you ask surgeons, when we've asked surgeons, what do you consider most important uh, in patient recovery after surgery? The vast majority of surgeons will say complications. Complications to them are, is the most important factor in how patients uh, recover from surgery. And it's very important. Um, obviously, complications are very important. And um, there's a lot of work done to decrease complications. Um, but even because even though surgeries become a lot safer, complex surgery is still associated with a high uh, rate of complications and even death. So if you're doing esophageal surgery, you know, there's still a mortality rate, one in 25, 4%. That's a lot. You know, we do 50, 60, 75 esophagectomies a year. So uh, complications, 45%. So if you take all those together from uh, more complex cancer surgery, uh, you know, between 20 and 45% will have a complication and between one and 4% of these patients having these scheduled surgery will, will die. So that's a, that's a, that's, that's, that's very notable. On the other hand, when you ask patients, uh, what's important to them, when you ask patients, what do they consider important in their recovery? Well, you get a, you get a different answer in asking patients this question. I don't think we've ever heard the word complication, um, as a, as an answer to this question. So what patients uh, talk about, and this is a work that um, uh, Professor Giulio Fiore has led, and his name will come up. And you, as you know, he's an outcome scientist in our department. And um, uh, Professor Fiore did this study um, where he interviewed uh, 30 patients from four different countries. So all the, what these countries have in common is they all had residents or fellows who had worked with us and could help us uh, get that done in their countries. About, uh, their, about their recovery experiences. And the main themes that emerged that what was important to patients as they recover from abdominal surgery was really functional status, returning to normal, returning to their habits and routines, regaining their independence, 
overcoming mental strains, resolution of symptoms, and basically uh, enjoying life. So those are the things that were important to patients when they recover from surgery. And the surgical stress response that I showed you in recovery from surgery are intimately related. And this is a great quote from Dr. Francis Moore, who's a giant of 20th century surgery, who made very deep contributions in surgical metabolism, as well as the development of organ transplantation and the care of critically ill surgical patients. And um, he worked at, um, at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, which is now the Brigham and Women's in Boston at Harvard for starting in 1948. And he said convalescence or what we call recovery now includes all the interlocking physical, chemical, metabolic and psychological factors commencing with the injury or even slightly before the injury and terminating only when the individual has returned to normal physical well-being, social and economic usefulness and psychological habitus. So that's basically what our patients are telling us, what Dr. Moore was very smart and, and said that in 1958. And just interestingly, there's a, a nice uh, McGill connection with Dr. Moore. Uh, as you may know, we are celebrating uh, the centennial 100th anniversary, 100th anniversary of our department, or we did in, 19, in uh, 2023. And I've been writing a paper about the history uh, of our department. And actually, Dr. Moore was one of three external reviewers for the McGill Department of Surgery in exactly the same year as he said this, as he wrote this quote, which is in 1958. And just this is a bit of a tangent, but this external reviewers were mandated to determine how well the department was performing in terms of the care of the sick, so clinical, the teaching of students, education, and the conduct of research. So our research mission, which are of course still our three main research missions. And unfortunately, I hope we would do better if Dr. Moore visited us today, which of course he, he can't, so that would, be, that, would be, that would be reportable. But their report, his report noted with regret that the staff were more interested in clinical practice than academic activities. And they made all kinds of uh, recommendations that uh, led to uh, improving that situation. So I just thought that was a nice connection to our department. So if we model the trajectory of recovery using measures of functional status uh, up here on the y-axis, because that's what patients tell us is important to them, and we have we can measure some baseline uh, measure of their functional status. Uh, and there's lots of different ways of doing that, either with questionnaires or with um, uh, measure, measuring uh, walking or, or other factors. And we can have a certain measure of that at baseline. Uh, and then we know that with that metabolic injury, that metabolic response to the injury of surgery, we have a rapid decline in patient functional status. And generally, that's the time that patients are not independent for activities of daily living and have to be in hospital. And then they have a slow return over weeks or probably months uh, back to baseline or maybe even above baseline, depending on uh, what the operation was meant to do. And uh, below a certain uh, line here, a patient is going to not be independent for functional activities. And we know that some patients never get back uh, to baseline because of complications or other factors. And that's really why complications, that's why complications, it's not that it's separate. It's not that patients don't care about complications, but the way it's incorporated and cared about is the impact on functional status. And so sir, I'm not saying that surgeons and patients don't care about the same thing. It's just that we're coming at it maybe from a different definition. But in the end, um, th that you can put it together uh, by the fact that complications will delay this return to functional um, fun functional status or independence. Um, and, and this is a great study. I didn't do it, but I, I wish we had done it. And it's a classic study now because it's, it's more than 20 years old. But basically, uh, in this study, uh, these uh, researchers uh, measured functional status and other uh, measures at baseline and then uh, weeks and months after surgery in older patients. And what's very striking is that six months after major surgery in these older patients over 65, 20% of them were still not back to baseline for instrumental activities of daily living, meaning that includes things like being able to do housework and manage your own uh, finances. And depending on the measure that you use, um, you know, when you get to more objective measures like uh, walking tests, uh, strength, muscle strength, uh, reach, which also has to do with muscle strength, so 60%, up to 50, 60, 40, 50, 60% of our older patients were not back to baseline six months after major surgery. And what were some of the risks for poor recovery complications? So as I mentioned, that's, uh, that's, that's clearly an important uh, factor that delays recovery. Physical status, so what, how patients, what their baseline activity was. 
um, which will come into why prehabilitation is an important strategy and other uh, comorbid factors like cognitive impairment, depression, or um, renal, renal failure. Um, and, and really that's, uh, that's why I personally originally became interested in the minimally invasive surgery as a specialty, because instead of those big open incisions, the uh, promise of minimally invasive surgery was that we were going to get rid of that, that additional trauma. We have to do what we do inside, but if we could get rid of the trauma that we need just for access to the inside, then that should have a big impact on decreasing the metabolic stress response and therefore improving recovery after surgery. So, right, that's pretty obvious, right? Um, so this is the, why uh, science is important. So this is what we, we thought as clinicians, but if, when, so we, so very early on, we did a very simple study, which was we asked how long it takes to recover after an elective gallbladder operation, elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. That's an operation that we were doing as, do as day surgery. So the patient comes in, they have an hour procedure and they leave their back in their house, you know, at 3 p.m. So they spend about three hours in the hospital. So pretty common, and we would consider not minor surgery, but certainly not major, major surgery. And I don't know if there's a clinical clinicians in the room who do lap coli, but when I talk to surgeons about this and you ask surgeons how long they tell their patients it's going to take to recover after this kind of operation, generally people will say about a week. But when we went ahead and measured it, we found using a self-reported physical activity. So it gives you an estimate of kilocalories per kilogram per week that a patient is expending on their physical activities. We found that a month after the surgery, only less than 50% of patients were actually recovered to their baseline activity levels. Of course, that's different. You know, it doesn't take long to recover back to very low intensity activities. If you're doing nothing, uh, you're still doing nothing uh, after the surgery. So that's uh, that's not, but if you're doing more higher intensity activities, uh, even at a month, so if you're uh, doing gym or, or, or you know, sports, uh, you were not, our patients at least, were not back to uh, baseline even a month after surgery. So that was a little bit of a surprise. So where did I go wrong in, in, in my, my assumptions? And where I went wrong was that, is, is that I live in my little silo and I live in my silo about my idea about improving recovery because, um, when we look at the outcomes of the surgical stress response, so that includes pain, as I mentioned, catabolism, fluid and salt retention to maintain plasma volume, immune dysfunction, nausea, vomiting, ileus, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I was very focused on the operation, which is, that's fine. I'm a surgeon. I was focused on the operation. And to me, if I, and I know there is lots of data that supports that minimally invasive surgery uh, does uh, have an impact on the, at least the hormonal response to surgery. Um, but it's um, but if we really want our patients to get the full benefit of these uh, advanced techniques that we use, we have to understand that there's a lot else going on around the surgery to patients that are in different silos. So they're in different medical specialties. So for sure, anesthesia. What kind of anesthesia are they receiving? Uh, were they receiving uh, neural blockade to block that afferent uh, response from the site of injury? either using nerve blocks or other techniques. Thoracic epidural at the time was also of a significant interest in preemptively blocking the metabolic response. So what, what, what's going on around anesthesia? What's going on around pharmacologic interventions that can be used? So again, multimodal analgesia, using techniques to avoid opioids, preventing nausea and vomiting before it even starts, using steroids, systemic local anesthetics, and then other more investigational techniques. And then other interventions, like giving patients an IV is an intervention, giving patients fluid. We don't think of it. We don't really think of it as an intervention. But if you take a patient and you give them four extra liters of crystalloid, that is not a physiologic uh, situation. Uh, temperature. So uh, patients leaving the operating room with a temperature of 32 degrees, once they get uh, into the recovery room, they're going to have a lot of shivering. And that is definitely going to increase uh, the metabolic stress response. Can we use carbohydrates, bringing patients into surgery in the starvation situation because they haven't eaten or drunk anything since NPO after midnight and now it's the next day. Uh, and exercise as an intervention, exercise as medicine, uh, boosting up functional status before the surgery and then not keeping people in bed and keeping them active to maintain muscle mass. So uh, where I went wrong was that um, most of these things are outside of the traditional purview of the surgeon. They're not under my control, uh, like how I perform the operation is. 
So how can I pull this all together as a surgeon, or how can we pull this all together uh, to get the best results for our patients? And the issue isn't that there isn't enough evidence. The issue isn't evidence. There's a lot of evidence about best practices around perioperative care and even guidelines. So these are a list of the ERAS, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society, that puts together these guidelines for optimal perioperative care. And there's at least 20 different elements that go into a patient having surgery. So all of those little tiny elements of perioperative care uh, go into this complex intervention. And you know, they make strong recommendations about optimal, how these things should be delivered and what we should be doing, you know, uh, in terms of pain, in terms of fluid, in terms of temperature, in terms of the surgery itself and so forth. These are strong recommendations, meaning they're backed up by randomized trials and several challenge traditions. So they tell us we should start doing things, but a lot of them say we should stop doing things. There are some things we do out of dogma and tradition in surgery and medicine that are based on dogma and tradition, and they have low value, and I'll define that to you in a minute. So they, they're low value interventions. And sometimes there's imp, we have an implementation problem, as I'll show you. So getting new evidence into practice has been esti estimated to take 17 years between a trial and it being um, implemented in practice, but we also have a de-implementation problem. So getting things out of practice that have been in there for a long time, if there's supporting evidence that it's no longer useful, how do we stop getting, how do we get that out of practice? That, as I showed you, there's multiple stakeholders. So how do we put it all together and get it into practice? Now, this is the good news. So the good news is that quality problems occur not because of a failure of goodwill. We all want the best for our patients, not necessarily because of knowledge. We might know what the guidelines say. And maybe not even because of us trying, we, we're trying pretty hard and it may not even be because of resources, but a lot of it is because of problems in the way we organize things. And that's good news because we can, we can do better. We can organize it better. So that's where ERAS comes in. And ERAS is basically the implementation of patient focused. So we wanna look at things that are gonna have an impact on the patient and we wanna reorganize our care around the patient rather than around the medical specialist. So the, and the, the patient being the ping pong ball that goes from specialty to specialty, let's organize care around the patient having a specific kind of common operation that we do. Standardized, meaning all of us at our hospital agree that this is going to be our way that we deliver care for this patient in general. Evidence-based, so it's based on evidence, there's some guidelines or guidelines, it's interdisciplinary, so we're bringing all those strands together. And they give us guidelines. A guidelines is a guideline. It doesn't mean it's, uh, there may be reasons why you didn't do it, but this is for the, this gives you a guideline and then you're the doctor and you have to decide if it's best for your patient. These integrate all the multiple interventions starting in the preoperative, so before the surgery, intraoperative and postoperative care. They're listed here and I've, I've touched on a bunch of them. Uh, so using uh, you know, uh, multimodal analgesia, avoiding uh, drains and tubes that are not uh, useful, prevention of nausea and vomiting, et cetera. Uh, eat early mobilization. So those are some of the things in the postoperative, preoperative, educating patients so they understand what's going to happen to them. Uh, we might, we're, we, we're avoiding long fasting periods. We're giving clear fluids up to two hours before the surgery, sometimes using carbohydrate loading. Uh, we're questioning whether, when we use a bowel preparation, and of course, all the surgical site infection prophylaxis that we do. And in the operating room, we try to use uh, minimally invasive surgery, um, and we, we, we give those uh, uh, prophylaxis or prevention of uh, nausea and vomiting. We think about how we're going to keep the patient warm, et cetera. So we bring all those together into a single guideline, a single pathway. And we know, and I'm going to show you some of this data from our own staff, uh, that implementation of these programs reduce post-operative complications, reduce length of stay. But they, even though the length of stay has come down so much, we're not just having people come back to hospital. So what's the issue? So we re if anybody reads the newspaper, you know that we have an aging population who are sicker than they were before. Uh, we also have better surgery, so it makes surgery part of treatment for more and more patients. So we have more demand, but access to surgery is not improving because of limited resources. Right now, our big problem is people. And so we have to really optimize what we do to, um, to, to optimize the resources that we do have and operate on as many people as we can. I want to tell you about the concept of value. So this is a, an important uh, concept that was put forward by um, uh, Michael Porter from the Harvard Business School. 
so this is uh, value can be defined as health outcomes achieved that matter to patients relative to the cost of achieving those outcomes. To, so to improve value, it's very simple. You either improve outcomes without raising costs or you lower costs without compromising outcomes. This is not about accepting worse outcomes because they, the cost is less. In fact, bad outcomes are in fact very expensive. Complications are very expensive and people not doing well is very expensive because they have to stay in hospital longer and need a lot of treatment. So how do we get, now I'd like to shift to our own uh, experience here. So how do we get started in this? This is probably my most important message. If you have a trusted mentor and they ask you to do something, you should say yes. So my mentor uh, asked me to write a book chapter about what was called fast track surgery at the time. And it was a revision of a chapter that was in a textbook written by Kellett, who was like sort of the innovator inventor of this technique. So me, and this is about uh, almost 20 years ago. So I was a junior person, but I always uh, took on uh, the work and agreed to write the book chapter, which meant I had, even though I didn't know much about it, I had to sit in the chair and review all the evidence. And when I did that, and we wrote this paper, thankfully, I got Franco Carly, who's our, who I'll show you his work in a bit as our prehabilitation guru. He actually was a surgical metabolism researcher, anesthesiologist, luckily. So we had did have one expert on writing this chapter. But basically, when I reviewed the literature, I had this kind of aha moment that we really need to do this. This is a simple, seems simple at the time, way to improve results. And the idea here would be that we'd apply this to the department as a whole. It wouldn't just be in general surgery. I'm a general surgeon. It would be across the department because we're so dependent here I don't have a surgery ward, a bed just for my patients. If if I succeed in this and we send all our general surgery patients home, then there'll just be a lot of orthopedic patients in the hospital, not to pick on orthopedics, but and we still have that now. But anyways, um, that the, the fact is we're very dependent. So we have to do it as a as a as a department. And and really what this led to was a culture change. It, it may shock you, but um if as a surgeon, I never sat down with an anesthesiologist and nursing. Uh, in, in a meeting to discuss in general how we were going to deliver care for a particular, around a particular kind of operation. Of course, we had conversations about a particular patient, but as a general team, as an institution, how we were going to put all those strands together. And this, this actually made us, made us do that. So it, we, we put together the steering committee with all the different multidisciplinary strands. So nutrition, physio, nursing, surgery, anesthesia, et cetera. We get everybody in the room and we create um, these uh, standard order sets, uh, patient education materials, uh, as I'll show you in a minute. And, and then we had the steering committee and then we worked with each expert. So each clinical lead in surgery, anesthesia, and nursing, who really, under, who, who that's their thing. That's what they do. So I can't tell a spine surgeon, I'm not an expert. I, I don't know how to do spine surgery. So we need their expertise, their interpretation of the guidelines to know what we're going to implement. And the point of this is, of, of, of having pathways and approach to this is to make it easy for people to do the right thing. So the, the, the deliverable from this group is the medical orders, anesthesia guidelines, nursing standards to avoid them having to uh, write down everything and save some time, let them do what, they, what, what, what nurses uh, should be focused on, which is taking care of patients, education. Uh, patient education is a huge part of this because we're uh, really need patients to be engaged in these pathways as we're really reducing the length of stay in the hospital. They need to be very engaged in their recovery. We have to navigate a very significant bureaucracy at our hospital. So multiple committees that were involved. How do we get through this? Anybody trying to do this on their own would just throw their hands up and 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 you know abandon it, which is what we saw happening. Uh, and then training the nurses, uh, especially on the units, to get used to this and then bringing in some kind of evaluation, which is why we get to write all of those papers. And uh, I'll show you some of them uh, now. So all of those things come together um, in this program that now uh, we started in 2008. So we're about uh, 15, 16 years into it. So what are the outcome? The deliverables were like these standard order sets, either now most of them are electronic, but we also focus a lot on always developing a patient version of the pathway. So this is a patient, this is the colorectal, the bowel surgery pathway, the patients who are going to, and I'll show you that this is a three-day pathway, but now we're, we're getting shorter and shorter, but uh, a version of the pathway that is interactive for patients, that they use a lot of, you know, graphic design, that they understand for each uh, element, what the targets are for each day, 
uh, what the goals are in terms of nutrition, uh, what's going to happen to their uh, any tubes and drains that they have, how we're going to manage their pain, what activities they should be focusing on, um, so that everybody's on the same page and we're all aligned with what the goals are for each day, and that we set a discharge target so that we all understand that if your recovery goes as expected, you'll be home on the third day, the second day, the fourth day, whatever that pathway uh, has. Why should we spend so much time on patient education and, and patient engagement? So this is work that uh, uh, Teodora Dimitra did. Uh, she's a surgical oncology fellow now, uh, but she did a PhD in experimental surgery with us and she really focused on what is called patient activation. Patient activation is beyond education. It's the knowledge, skills, confidence, and motivation to participate in your own healthcare. The nice thing about patient activation is it's probably modifiable. Um, and there might be ways to coach people once you identify, though, that they have a low level of patient activation. And this was a really nice uh, study that Teddy did uh, because she uh, did this survey that uh, scores your patient activation level for patients of uh, 600, 700 patients that we had undergoing major inpatient surgery. And about a quarter of them scored as having low levels of this patient activation. And those patients were our patients who got into trouble. Uh, they had a much higher uh, use of the emergency department. They had much higher use or risk of using uh, of unplanned healthcare visits, so clinic or CLSC. Um, and uh, but they didn't get readmitted more. So it meant that they were seeking healthcare issues for their healthcare issues, but potentially were things that could be dealt with in another avenue, not in the emergency room, because they didn't have something so bad that they needed to be admitted. Uh, so this was really nice study. And uh, also those patients had more complications and a longer length of stay. And the interesting thing about patient activation is it's independent of education. You could have a CEO who's very passive with their healthcare. It's independent of income. Um, it's independent of comorbidities. So, and it's something that's modifiable. So that's why we spend a lot of time developing patient version of the pathway. And over the last 15 years, we've developed uh, about 35 of these pathways, they touch every division in our hospital, uh, including cardiac surgery. That was our most recent one. It was implemented just in July of 2023, very complex. Uh, and now a lot that we're focusing on is same-day discharge. So patients who are having, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but having their knee replaced, having obesity surgery, having colorectal surgery, even some lung cancer surgery, are, we're able to get them out of the hospital the same day, no admission, at all building on these, on these pathways. And uh, as I mentioned, we created this research program to tell us if we are bringing value, if we are bringing value to patients, are we bringing value to the institution? And this is work that was led by uh, Dr. Larry Lee, who is a colorectal surgeon and uh, did his PhD in experimental surgery, focusing on health economics. And he did this study um, uh, comparing two institutions for colorectal surgery uh, one institution uh, delivering conventional care and one delivering enhanced recovery using this uh, pathway technique. And what he showed was that patients, it's not just about kicking patients out of hospital before they're ready to go home. Uh, what he could show was that the patients in the enhanced recovery pathway were meeting their recovery milestones earlier. So they're mobilizing out of bed uh, on the first day instead of the second day, uh, not using IV fluids, um, had return of bowel function, and we're eating uh, faster. We we're letting people eat on post-up day zero. So after the surgery, rather than keeping them without any intake for a couple of days um, and getting the drains out. And because of that, in this early study, the length of stay was reduced from seven days to four days. And when we look at, um, but there was no difference in readmissions. There was no difference in complications. And there was no difference in the severity of complications. And then we also looked at some of those more patient-centered outcomes. Uh, so the patients having enhanced recovery had fewer days lost from work. Their caregivers, we weren't just shifting the burden to people at home to take care of their mother or mother-in-law. Um, they, they the caregivers actually had lo fewer lost days from work after uh, for the patients in the enhanced recovery hospital. And they had fewer CLSC visits after enhanced recovery. They actually had more visits after traditional care. And when you you can put when you put when you do the value equation on that and you actually put costs with that as well, and putting it all together. So here on the left side you have the mean difference in costs 
uh, favoring the enhanced recovery uh, pro protocol hospital, and this one would be favoring traditional care. So you can see that from the different health um, uh, lenses, so for co cost effectiveness lenses, there was uh, institutional cost savings for the enhanced recovery program, but that uh, wasn't statistically significant. Healthcare system costs, so that includes CLSC visits, outpatient visits, and physician remuneration. There wasn't, there was uh, a benefit to about $1,600 for the enhanced recovery, but that wasn't statistically significant. But when you put it all together and you look at it from a societal perspective, so really the whole trajectory of care, and you bring in lost, uh, uh, the economic aspects, so not working or caregivers not working. Now you had a, we had a societal benefit to these programs of about three thousand dollars per patient, uh, and now this was statistically significant. When we look, uh, where where are these savings coming from? This is another study uh, that looked uh, at esophagectomy, or esophagectomy with an O, because this was in the British Journal of Surgery, and they spell things uh, funny. So this one is about the specific uh, costs, why was enhanced recovery program less expensive? Why were there cost savings? Well, there were cost savings in lab tests. There were cost savings in pharmacy tests. There was cost savings in imaging. And there were no difference in the OR, which makes sense. There was, we, we stopped uh, sending patients directly to the ICU. So that was a saving. And there was shorter length of stay. So that was a saving. And so really this is about, so if the ICU and those blood, blood tests and those imaging tests and those lab tests weren't, weren't furthering the value, then that's about stopping to do things. That's about de-implementation. And the savings for this, just for this, were about $2,600 per patient. And if we do, you can do the math, if we do 75 of these a year, uh, well, that's very helpful uh, to supporting uh, the program. And that's, that's where we talk about value. And um, this was this kind of uh, pattern we've seen no matter what uh, procedures we looked at. Uh, so the pattern of decreasing length of stay uh, that we saw in colon, esophagectomy, lung resection, prostatectomy, hepatectomy, either no difference in complications. So we weren't increasing complications. And in some cases, there were fewer complications uh, and no difference in readmissions. Uh, and that And that's why it results in lower costs, and that's been a, a, a consistent pattern, no matter how you look at it. The question is, okay, so is this scalable or is this something just um, fan magic that we can do? This is a project that Dr. Professor Barrowlett mentioned that we did with uh, the American College of Surgeons uh, to implement this uh, in um, um, 15 uh, hospitals. And this is a much higher level of science. I won't go into the details, but basically, uh, we were able to compare hospitals that implemented this approach versus hospitals that didn't. And, and you could see that length of stay, um, you know, there's secular trends to decreasing length of stay anyways, but there was a much bigger decrease in length of stay in the pilot hospitals. Uh, but also when you, when you start having thousands of patients, you can see a decrease in complications. Um, you didn't see that in the control hospitals, but we saw a significant decrease in morbidity uh, in, the patient, in the hospitals implementing this care pathway approach. So that's a lot of blah, 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 but how do the patients look? So this is just an example of a patient. So this is a patient at the Montreal General. This is the day after he's had the right half of his colon removed. You can see he looks pretty comfortable. And actually in the morning, he wasn't in his room because he went out on the mountain bird watching. So that was an, that's one of the nice things about the Montreal General, and this was the summer. So off he went. Uh, so this, had, this is a complex intervention. He had very good surgery. I won't get into the details, but very advanced techniques, difficult techniques. Um, he had very good anesthesia. He had, uh, uh, you know, nerve blocks. He's He's been benefited from 15 years of enhanced recovery learning and education. And, um, you know, that patient, um, you may ask yourself, you know, what happened to that metabolic stress response? If he looks like um, he's ready, you know, if he, he doesn't look like he's had an operation. And um, this, you know, to answer that question, you know, this is a, a randomized trial that we did. It was led by Negar Karimian. She was a PhD student of mine. Uh, and this is the study that she did. She was a P she received a PhD in experimental surgery. So this, this is an, a randomized trial. We don't have to get into the details, but basically this was about the impact of uh, using carbohydrate drinks and what the impact would be on uh, surgical stress as measured by insulin sensitivity. And basically this was done using the gold standard way of measuring uh, insulin resistance. 
And there was no difference between the simple carbohydrate and the complex carbohydrate drink. But what I want to bring home with this is that actually three quarters of our patients had preserved insulin sensitivity, meaning three quarters of the patients that we operated on for their colon surgery did not demonstrate a metabolic stress response, at least as measured by insulin sensitivity. In, you know, what did we used to see when we did open colon surgery without enhanced recovery? About 70% of patients had uh, a metabolic stress response. And now we saw in this study, 25% of patients had any metabolic stress response. And that might be why we can't show benefit of whether you drank the drink or you didn't drink the drink. So that begs the question, if um, where do we go from there? So if, if, you know, in my day, in my training, we were doing traditional care, everybody got an NG tube, it was pretty miserable, and you stayed in the hospital if everything went down for seven days. Then we went to enhanced recovery, we reduced uh, the target, you know, to three days, and and then we brought it to one day because patients, you know, were looking great, and we were keeping them overnight, but then sending them home. So if they're looking so great, can we actually push this to outpatient surgery? So I want to talk a little bit about that now. Um, one of the adjuncts that we're using in trying to safely discharge patients from hospital is digital health uh, and the ability to monitor uh, patients who are not uh, don't have to stay in the hospital. So that's um, you know that's I think a big area of interest. And we know that even whether you're recovery, whether you're doing day surgery, just like I showed you with the lap coli, the majority of our recovery now is happening outside the hospital. So this again is uh, work that uh, Dr. Lee has really led and uh, now that he's a, he's a surgeon scientist and developing these same day discharge pathways for colon surgery um, and supported by some digital, digital health applications. And we worked with uh, industry to develop uh, this app uh, that included all of our patient education, all of our uh, questionnaires, and also the ability for patients to communicate with the healthcare team in a HIPAA compliant way uh, so that if there's trouble at home, then they can get in touch. And uh, this is work that he recently um, presented and published, but basically the bottom line is here, um, you know, this is preliminary work. He's, uh, this was the first 115 patients recruited. This has started just before COVID. And what happened was in COVID when there was no hospital beds and very poor access to surgery and people having cancer, they signed up they wanted to do it. They wanted to have their cancer operation. So that was one thing that helped us uh, with COVID. So um, this is um, about, but what we see now is that about 25% of our patients are eligible for this because only about that, that eligible for this and are going through it. So about 50% of the patients met the criteria. You need a smartphone. You needed to live within 50 kilometers of the hospital. You know, you needed to be able to answer the questionnaires. And about half of those patients agreed to be enrolled in the study. So about 25% of our patients now. Um, and of these addition of these initial 114 patients recruited, 85% um, of them were discharged successfully from the recovery room of those patients. And the main outcome for safety was we wanted to make sure they weren't just coming back. Um, and so we had about five of those patients came back to the emergency room within 72 hours. And that was our target our definition of safety because generally we were keeping patients for 72 hours in hospital. Uh, so 5% uh, of them uh, came back. Uh, so overall, it's something like 80% uh, success rate uh, of the same day discharge pathway. And patients were satisfied with this approach. They didn't feel that they needed to stay in the hospital, at least 80% of them. 95% of them were satisfied with their recovery of home and 80% were satisfied with how they communicated through the app. So very reassuring. What could be another, what could be the next uh, step in digital health? This is not our study, but this is a group uh, at Harvard who are using wearables to basically just, you know, what my, my smartwatch does and your smartwatch does has an accelerometer. And what this showed was that patients who had a post-operative event so a complication or a return to the operating room had a completely different uh, pattern of average activity uh, in the six weeks after surgery. And so the question is, can we use that to predict eventually patients who are going to get into trouble based on uh, their trajectory of those kinds of automated metrics? So something to work on for the future. Uh, we've developed now, uh, the thing at the Montreal General is we have a lot of bed pressures. So there's a lot of incentive to develop these trajectories to uh, get our patients operated on. Uh, we, so now we have about 30% of our patients having colorectal surgery. 
our, our day surgery, about 50% of our patients having benign foregut surgery. Uh, hip and knee arthroplasty, about 65% are leaving from the recovery room. Bariatric surgery, uh, about 50% of our sleeve gastrectomy patients are uh, leaving from the recovery room and even have started some pilot work in um, lung cancer surgery. Uh, again, working, very important to have the patients on the same page with this. This is an innovative uh, approach, so making sure that we have our patient versions of the pathway. Of course, uh, well, this is work that done, was done by, Stephan, uh, by Tiffany Paradis, uh, who's a surgical resident, just went back to her clinical after her master's. And she looked at uh, the, um, under Larry's supervision, the cost reduction for same-day discharge now versus our traditional enhanced recovery pathway. Uh, so obviously sending patients home and having, even if they came back and needed to be readmitted, all of it together, they were counted in the results. Um, but the length of stay was one day on average for the same day discharge patients and about four days for traditional enhanced recovery, whether we're looking at stoma reversal or formal colectomy. And so for colectomy, if you're saving $2,500, this is just direct medical costs in the hospital and you're doing 140 a year, that uh, starts to add up. Uh, in terms of the value you're bringing uh, from that program and the same sort of pattern for stoma reversal. So uh, as uh, Jake mentioned, um, there's interest in this. If you read the newspapers, you know that we're not doing very well, especially from after the pandemic. We were never doing very well. We always had very long wait lists, but the pandemic has made it worse. And as we've lost uh, personnel, that's made it worse. Uh, so, um, you know, here's a total waiting for cancer surgery in our province, 160,000 people, and that has going, is going up. Uh, well, sorry, that's surgery overall. This is cancer surgery, 4,400, um, increasing 5% from period to period. So from month to month, that's going in the wrong direction. You see surgeons that some of you may know uh, decrying the situation, uh, raising the alarm bells. And so provincially now, this is looked at as, as Professor Barlight mentioned, as a strategy perhaps for helping create capacity uh, because when we did the survey, fewer than 50% of centers in the province were using these kinds of ERAS principles. Same day discharge, for example, was only 8% in colorectal. As I mentioned, we're at about 30%. I think these were all of our patients and about 25% for hip arthroplasty and we're at about 70%. So the goals of this provincial pro project are decreased length of stay and complications to improve access by creating access to beds. And the, pro the province funded a nurse coordinator in each uh, institution for three years and focusing on uh, these kinds of procedures, hip and knee arthroplasty, colorectal, pediatric, the one they chose was scoliosis and cardiac surgery for those specialized centers. This is a coached implementation and we at the MUHC are developing the audit and feedback tool to help support uh, you know, these, these quality improvement efforts so the, each uh, institution knows where they are. And so briefly, just in the next few minutes, the next big thing I think that's, uh, that you may have already heard uh, talks about in your, in your seminar is prehabilitation. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, complica complications, surgeons hate complications, um, and we kind of blame ourselves when there's a complication or a bad outcome. And this is a study we didn't do, but it's from NISQIP data. And we know there's a lot of variability between surgeons uh, in outcomes. Um, and, we, and like I mentioned, we, we, we tend to blame ourselves. But in this study, of this is colectomy, 35% of the variation in outcomes is related to what the patient brings to the table. So their comorbidities, their frailty. And only 2% 2 per, 2 of the variability in uh, complications was from surgeon factors and only 2% from hospital factors. So you could be the highest performing surgeon in the highest performing hospital. And if you have the most comorbid patient, 66% of those patients had a complication. So it's not your fault, surgeons. So the, this kind of begs the question of, so if you have a patient, and I told you at the beginning that recovery, the strongest factor, the second strongest factor for problems or delayed recovery is physical status at baseline. So the question is, and if we know that so much of this risk factor for complications and bad outcomes is because of patient factors, can that, is that modifiable? Is that something that can be trained up? So like this is great Nike commercial of this, Sister, uh, she's a nun. She's run like Ironman triathlons uh, in her 80s or something. So it's pretty incredible. If you've never seen that commercial, uh, find it on YouTube. It's pretty pretty inspiring. 
But so what would this look like using our model? So the idea here is if we take people before the surgery and we increase their functional status or functional capacity using prehabilitation, even if they follow the same decline, that same slope, they will potentially never fall below that level of functional uh, dependency and will come back to that baseline level uh, faster. And the idea here is, this is the big idea is that recovery starts before surgery. So we want to use exercise, nutrition, um, relaxation techniques to improve, give a, give, a, give a cushion so that a patient can better uh, withstand that upcoming metabolic stress of surgery that's planned, just like any kind of event like a triathlon is planned. And of course, exercise is really, really good. Chronic exercise, the concept of exercise as medicine. So what does chronic exercise do? So it increases our aerobic capacity, which we know is, is going to be impacted by surgery. It increases the ratio of lean body mass to fat. So we have more of that protein, that lean body mass that we know is going to be affected by surgical catabolism. It decreases sympathetic overreactivity. So we know if we're going to be releasing a lot of catecholamines, if uh, that'll be decreased uh, from exercise, it improves ins insulin sensitivity, which I told you is the hallmark of that diabetes of a surgery uh, response. It also improves mood, decreases anxiety. So you might say it's good for patients. It's probably good for surgeons and probably good for scientists also. Uh, so this is uh, Dr. Carley's program. You can see it's complicated. It's not just about telling people to go take a walk or drink carbohydrates. This is about increasing functional reserve. And it leads into as a preoperative component of enhanced recovery. It includes, I know, I think you've probably had talks on this, but it includes uh, exercise, that's a big part of it, nutritional intervention, these relaxation techniques, as well as medical optimization. Each of these could be a talk on its own, but putting it all together for patients, offering it in the pre-op center, um, evaluating patients and seeing where the deficits are and targeting those in a personalized way is really uh, where the field is going. And Dr. Carley's made huge uh, con contributions like this, this study, and he's done most, I mean, a uh, huge number of the randomized trials in this field are Dr. Carley's trials. This is just an example in colon cancer, uh, just to show you that it looks like the model that I showed you. So you have your functional capacity. This was in walk distance in six minutes on the y-axis. You have the patients in the uh, solid line who got the prehabilitation, boosting up their walking capacity pre-op so that although they follow pretty much the same slope, uh, they don't drop to where uh, a month after surgery, they're not, uh, or two months after surgery, they are recovered or even above where they were at baseline versus patients who didn't have the program in the preoperative time were still not recovered to baseline. There was no difference in the study in length of stay or complications because it's just probably not, that's a power problem. So when now Dr. Carley has been involved in, um, you know, in, in influencing many people around the world, this is a randomized trial, multi-institutional uh, in colon cancer patients uh, from uh, I think 15 centers uh, four weeks prehab and showing that this approach decreased uh, severe complications and decreased medical complications. And for all those functional status, uh, looks exactly like the, uh, the model that I showed you uh, in terms of walking distance and in terms of uh, self-reported physical activities and, and grip strength. So this is real and this is an important part of enhanced recovery. So uh, where do we go from here? How is this scalable? Dr. Carley and his clinic and his team spend hours and hours with patients uh, individually, but if this is going to be scaled, it has to be in the community. And again, this is where there's probably a huge opportunity for uh, digital health applications that, again, link into our patient engagement and our patient activation, looking at uh, performance measures, giving personalized coaching, maybe in an automated way, um, allowing for much better collaboration between the family doc in, in the community or the kinesiologist or physio in the community, anesthesia, surgery, booking the patient to know when they're exactly optimized and ready for surgery and being able to deliver those kind of behavioral change techniques that I mentioned that are probably going to be very important in, in patient activation, um, setting goals, just like we would train. If anybody uses Strava, if anybody looks at their data from their watch, then you know that this is highly motivating and it's probably the way that it's going to be scaled in the community. But how do we, what are we actually going to be measuring? Patient reported outcomes. So what patient reported outcomes should we use? Just to close the loop a little bit, 
uh, go back to Professor Fiore's uh, great work in recovery. You remember that recovery means functional recovery to patients. So how do we measure that? Well, it turns out that the best way to measure that, well, I told you that you can do that with objective measures, but we can also do that, which means that we have to measure how fast somebody walks or so there's a little bit of equipment and training involved, or we can measure that with patient reported outcomes. So are you back to normal? What's defining normal? What's your activity levels like? What are your symptoms like? So using this, that's where this qualitative work was done to feed into developing a patient reported outcome for recovery. And you could say, well, let's just use what's out there, but it turns out that there's nothing out there that's very good for this. So uh, again, Professor Fiore did this uh, systematic review of what, what's out there to recover for patient reported outcomes to tell us about how they're recovering from abdominal surgery. And he didn't find very good measures out there. They weren't uh, made, they weren't developed under our modern scientific standards. And they have very limited evidence supporting that they actually can measure what we want them to measure. And that's just to finish up uh, Professor Fiore's developing, and it's very difficult, very long work, a, uh, a new patient reported outcome measure specifically targeting to measure recovery. Thankfully, he's going to do the thing that I've been interested in getting done for 30 years and was not able to do it. And this is why this, you know, the science, the scientists and the clinicians coming together is, I know it sounds like mom and apple pie, but it's so critical. There was, you know, the, the, the level of the ability to get this work done in an, in a, in an excellent way that's going to make it useful for uh, people uh, internationally is, is just something that I could not do on my own. Um, and phase one was this qualitative part uh, that I showed you and that's been published. And phase two is ongoing, which is develop the items and the questions. And then phase three will be, uh, and that's um, going to be presented this year at uh, our SAGES meeting. And then to do basic uh, measurement uh, property um, uh, assessment uh, will be the last phase and then have uh, electronic format and paper format for this new patient reported outcome measure. So those are three areas where I think enhanced recovery after surgery uh, is, is these are sort of the exciting areas that we're in right now. Patient reported outcomes, uh, digital health applications and prehabilitation, digital health applications to support ultra short hospital stay or no hospital stay. So those were some of the new er areas in ERAS. So just to summarize, looking at the R, patient recovery, Patient recovery is a patient-centered outcome that's important to patients and it's important to our healthcare systems. Um, it can be quantified. So I showed you some performance-based outcomes like walking tests and uh, ideally using patient-reported outcomes um, and that's uh, coming soon. And, um, and that this ERAS 2.0, I think I've shown you that over 15 years, this is a sustainable strategy. It's not a one and done. It's a building over 15, 20 years to continually improve all of the little interventions, bringing some in, taking some out uh, that will improve interdisciplinary care, at least for us it has, help us get evidence into practice, which is a challenge, evaluate new evidence, as I've shown you, embedding different uh, RCTs and uh, evaluations of innovative aspects, but embedding that in the context of, of, of uh, enhanced recovery after surgery pathways, improving value. So outcomes that matter to patients and outcome that matters to patients is recovery and the cost of that and really driving meaningful changes. And I hope I've shown you that in the care for our patients. We can do this. This is something that physicians, clinicians, scientists, we, we can do this. Sometimes it seems like so many things are out of our control. We don't have access to beds. We don't have access to this or that. Well, this is still in our control. And um, our relationship with our patients and the innovative care we bring to our patients, that's our job. Um, and uh, when it doesn't look like it from day one to day 15, but when you look at it over a 15, 20 year horizon, uh, you can see that these kinds of programs involving so, so many people have, I believe, uh, really uh, driven uh, improved change, improved uh, care for the better. Uh, so thank you, I'm gonna stop there. Sorry, it's two o'clock. Uh, but uh, I can uh, wait. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, can wait uh, if we want to extend for a few more minutes to take any questions. I'd be happy to do that. But thank you for listening. Great. So if you're um, if you're happy to take questions, I'll try and uh, take care of uh, everyone. But beforehand, I'm going to abuse my uh, microphone yeah. and quickly ask you something. 
So when I think about shock and non-lethal shock, I think of going into cold water, <clears throat> which probably to me would kill me. Uh, but some people can train for shock, right? They can go swimming in freezing cold water. They're perfectly okay with training. Yeah. So the kind of insults people get, like the non non-lethal shock inducing events are people that are kind of let's say tougher generally do they recover better or or do people for example that work outdoors and maybe injure quite a lot or not have regular meals and right um that's a good question it's a complicated question because i think it uh it's not as intuitive as one might think so um and for sure if somebody is there's a strong association between exercise capacity and complications and death. So that's clear. So if you put somebody on a, you you do like formal cardiopulmonary exercise testing, that's called CPET, you put them on an exercise bike, you measure their VO2 max. So you get them to exercise to volitional exhaustion, you measure their VO2 max, or you measure their anaerobic uh, capacity, there's different measures. And, and so you know, let's say anaerobic, um, capacity is clearly associated with outcomes, complications, and death. Now, so if you take the the lowest, ex the, the you know low exercise capacity, clearly that's a risk factor. And Dr. Carley has shown that if you, on in general, if you take people at risk like that, and you improve their exercise capacity, uh, you will decrease their risk of complications. So, so those things I think are pretty clear. So at, at that end of the spectrum, which is the low end of the spectrum, that's pretty clear. Uh, when you're looking at bad outcomes like complications and deaths. But if you take people who are healthy people, for sure they're already at the upper end of that exercise capacity ceiling. So you won't necessarily get them to be have better recovery by so they could walk 500 meters by getting them to 550 meters, whereas getting someone from 300 to 400 probably makes a big difference. So I, it really is complicated because it depends where you are on the scale. It also depends, and I touched on this a little bit, where you're starting. So if you take a healthy person who's running a marathon, they're not going to be running a marathon a week after surgery, but they will be back to sitting on their sofa watching TV or even back to their laptop doing their work. But are they recovered? No, because their level of recovery is so high. So, I, I mean, it's a complicated question. It's an interesting question. I think um, hopefully I touched on some of it. Thank you. Uh, Alexandrine, you have a question? Um, yes, I have a question for uh, surgeries more like, um, I'm thinking of my friend who had um, ankle surgery because he broke his ankle during workout and he used uh, an electrical stimulation device during his recovery and he recovered much faster than his doctor anticipated so i was wondering uh, is that that kind of device could it work for patients that weren't active before because from what i understand from today is that he recovered fast because he was active mostly um yeah i think i want to differentiate between sort of overall functional status, right? So that's like, you know, your overall ability to exercise, which his was probably very high, versus recovering a specific body part or for what's important in the ankle, or you could say what's important in, let's say breast surgery. So you're gonna have a mastectomy for breast cancer and they're gonna take your lymph nodes out of your underarm and maybe there's specific exercises for your lymphatics that you could do before the surgery to prevent, uh, you know, uh, arm swelling after the surgery. So I think that we want to divide that into disease-specific or system-specific issues versus overall, um, overall, um, you know, functional status. So for your friend, and the same goes for devices or interventions. So, um, you know, that device would be evaluated in the context of let's make sure that we were taking care of all those other pathway factors. So we're not just giving your friend lots of opioids after surgery, which makes them tired, makes them nauseous, which makes them constipated. So, you know, so that you could see the benefit of maybe that, whatever that device was, um, 
that might bring additional value. So I'm not, I don't know the specifics of that device, but again, if and there's not going to be a magic bullet for, you know, improving your overall exercise capacity before the surgery. And I would separate that from frailty. That's completely different. Um, we have many non-frail, hardy, obese people who have very poor functional status. Um, so I know I'm not exactly answering your question. I would say intuitively, it's better to go into surgery fit. But as I mentioned, it's the focus of the prehabilitation is on those patients at risk for pneumonia, heart attacks, things like that. Not so much of like how quickly you recover, uh, you know, from your ankle fracture. Question from uh, Joshua. I, I guess you you mentioned it at the beginning, but uh, he's asking what are the barriers to implementing errors. I guess I guess it's pretty clear it, it is it's efficient or is you know um, so yeah. why. why doing it we well why isn't everybody doing it well first of all everybody will say that they're doing it so you don't know what people are doing until you measure it so that's you know when we did the surveys as i mentioned provincially this is surveying nurses not surveying surgeons about what's happening at their center maybe 50 percent were doing using some of these things this is, it sounds like nothing, I understand that, but it's really a complete reorganization of the way we approach perioperative care. So before we did this, I would do my own thing as a surgeon. I'd write my own, or you know, I'd do the, or I'd understand the literature the way I understood it, or maybe I keep up with the literature, maybe I don't. Um, and I write my own orders and my friend writes his orders a little differently. I allow my patients to eat, he doesn't. I allow my, I want my patients out of bed. He wants them resting. I want my IV out earlier. He wants it to stay in, vice versa, whatever. But each of those things has an evidence base. And there's also a lot of variability between the surgeons. So anybody here who trained in medicine, or if you're a resident, you know that some people will yell at you because you gave a certain medication. And some people will yell at you because you didn't give that medication. And you've got to figure out, it's like being in high school on day one, what your supervisor wants from you. So, but you have to think like maybe there is, isn't there some, is there evidence to support one way or another? So this is bringing that together before the surgery, getting people around the table to make, have these discussions, having a literature review that we have a librarian do to bring us what, and a lot of things don't have any evidence behind it. And therefore for those things, we'll discuss as a group what we want to do. So it's just very different than the way we practice, the way we have traditionally practiced. Um, and I would say we're doing it in surgery. We're doing it here. Other places don't do it. People don't do it in medicine. You know, if you come in with a heart attack, you're gonna, you don't necessarily gonna have this kind of a care pathway or diabetes management. Um, not to pick on anybody, but and also you, like I said, as part of our provincial rollout, we're coaching the institutions for how to bring these teams together. We're giving them standard order sets that they can modify, but they're based on the literature. We're giving them an audit tool. So in real time, they can see, okay, are my patients coming to the OR still fasting after midnight or not? Are they getting multimodal analgesia? Yes, no. So setting this up and then giving them a dashboard, which also is a fair bit of, of work to conceptualize and harder than I thought it was gonna be. Um, but it is, but th that's what, and that's, that's what has to happen. So the coaching, the data, uh, so it's not, it sounds like nothing, but it's um, it's it's really a difference in the way that we pra have practiced traditionally. Thanks. So, a question from Razan. <clears throat> I think I know the answer. Uh, do you have meetings with anesthesiologists at McGill hospitals in each major operation to have a common plan for implementation? So yes, I mean, so the, each of these pathways was developed by having a meeting, or ten, or a hundred, or how many it takes sitting around a table um, and uh, creating those orders together. Um, because what happens in the operating room, what happens before the operation affects what happens after the operation. So if, if, if we don't, if the patient's puking because they got a lot of opioids, I'm simplifying, a lot of opioids and a lot of fluids and uh, we didn't give them uh, prophylaxis, then I can't feed them right after the surgery. I can't get their IV out. Uh, then they get them ileus and then yeah, then, then we're done. We can't send them home from the PACU or they're gonna stay for a week and have complications. So each of these elements has downstream. So that's 
yes, so anesthesia, nursing, physio, nutrition. We did it a lot more formally in the first, I would say, 10 years. I'd say we do a lot by Zoom now and by, you know, emails, but um, the same concept is there. The day of the surgery is a whole other thing. We, of course, we use a surgical safety checklist um, to go through the specific issues for a specific patient on that day. Surgery and nursing, yeah. I was asking for your thoughts on prophylactic administration of antibiotics prior to GI procedures for high-risk patients. Surgery, gastrointestinal surgery, bowel resection. Yeah, all those patients get um, IV antibiotics. There has been more controversy about when you're, if you're going to give a bowel prep. Um, this went back and forth. If you're using a mechanical bowel prep, if they should get uh, oral antibiotics at the same time, I would say the state of the evidence right now is that strongly to say that they should. If you're going to use a mechanical bowel prep, they should get the patient should get oral antibiotics as well at the same time. I think Vaxin has a question too. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I think Faxon has a question. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to going to end on Faxon, but anyway, go on. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Feldman. Uh, that's a wonderful presentation. I would, um, this is uh, clearly a paradigm shift and uh, it's, 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 it's great. So one of the questions that come up is, uh, are there then policies that need to change to support the wide, widespread uh, adoption of ERAS protocols? What are the policies that need to change? So are there policies that need to change? In, in order to support the ERAS protocols, because this is clearly all good and it's going the right direction. Um, the, the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, how adaptable are these ERAS protocols to various types of surgeries? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll yeah. start with that one. Uh, very, very, I mean, it's a, it's a framework. So we've uh, created over 35 of these. They touch on every division, every kind of operation, uh, from the most simple, so uh, outpatient hernia surgery to the most complex, cardiac, esophagectomy, uh, cystectomy, uh, head and neck resections with flaps, um, you know, ICU, no ICU, uh, anywhere from zero length of stay to seven day length of stay. So very adaptable. It's really like making sure that the pathway includes, uh, you know, some of the higher level evidence. So they have to have something about patient education, something about uh, nutrition, something about how you do the surgery, something about opioid sparing, something about uh, nerve blocks or analgesia, something about uh, mobilization of patients. So, you know, all of those, let's say 10, 15 categories and uh, you have to address. So it's really more of a framework. Uh, so definitely adaptable to basically anything, not just procedures, it's very adaptable procedures because you know the date that it's happening. So that's helpful in surgery. Um, the policies that need to change, I I don't know that it's, well, you could do it by policy. I prefer the carrot to the stick, probably just in terms of effectiveness, because again, if it takes 17 years to get evidence into practice, then whatever we're doing now, and I didn't give you any good example, but let's say fasting guidelines, MPO after midnight. Everybody mostly probably knows that you're supposed to be fasting after before surgery, right? I mean, it's like in the in the zeitgeist. But guidelines going back to the 1990s from anesthesia societies show that it's safe to continue clear fluids up to two hours before general anesthesia. But nobody was doing that. So until we had enhanced recovery after surgery pathways that allowed us to bring the groups together and figure out how we were going to do it. Um, so it's not so much about having guidelines or even policies. Uh, I think it's about supporting teams to make it easy for them to do it. So that's why I think when we were trying to advise the ministry about how to roll this out, we said you need to put resources to it. You need a coordinator. That we I, Oh, I forgot to say, I didn't do any of this work. Debbie Watson did all the work. Debbie Watson, who's the nurse who we got as a pilot project for one year when I pitched this idea to Dr. Ella Lally, who was our chair at the time, he said, you can have a nurse from the pre-op clinic for one year. And in that, he forgot about it. And then two years later, asked us about it. And by then we had a lot of data to support it. But Debbie did all, does all the work. The nurses do all the work to, you know, to coordinate this. They we're just like, you know, doing our surgery and stuff like that. So 
uh, I think you have to put someone to do the project management, to do the emails, to help get it through all the bureaucracy, um, not the research and not the surgery and not the anesthesia, but the actual like doing it. So that so that's why we said you have to put somebody at each institution to do it. And you need the tools to do it. You don't want to be looking at the blank page. You can revise. So you want to use other people's stuff. And then finally, you need to have the audit tool. It's for quality improvement to close the loop. It's basic, you know, plan, do, study, act plan your project based on your quality indicator. I want my length of stay to be lower. I want my complications to be lower. Set what that is. You plan your intervention, you do it, and then you see if it worked. It was very simple, but you, we don't have, we didn't have all this stuff. Now the ministry has at least done a three-year project to, to give the resources that hopefully will drive this change. There's a... <clears throat> There's a question from Mashe is asking, how, how can you educate patients so that they start to be more eager and I guess demanding of uh, ERAS kind of? Yeah, great, great question. I, and maybe I touched on it uh, after you, you made the comment, but um, I think I think we're stuck. I think there's a bit of, for, for us personally, I think we need to be much more personalized with that. I mean, we have like that great PDF or that great, uh, graphic, but I think that's very uh, 2008. And I think um, developing stuff that's going to be much more targeted, more interactive. So we are, um, we did get, uh, well, Larry got a uh, a nice uh, uh, contract from, from the government again to develop more widely his um, app, but it's more than an app. It's a patient platform. So it's a patient facing platform where you sign in, you have the video, now we have videos, you have, it's a little more interactive um, and you do the questionnaires and you get the instructions and you get the feedback. So I think that's an area and maybe, you know, of course, I think there should be automated metrics, wearables. I think this is a very, very active area where there has not been a lot of work, where I think is very open to new ideas and new research programs. Let's we'll let uh, Ronnie have the last question. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Feldman, for the presentation. I'm the clinical kinesiologist in the prehab clinic with Dr. Carly, and also doing my master's here uh, in experimental surgery. I was just wondering, um, you bring up a slide about recovery uh, after surgery, and I wanted to know, how do you think we could implement exercise at that point, point post-operatively, considering you showed that if they're not as active, we usually see more complications. So do you think there's room for exercise after exercise, and how can we safely do it? Definitely. I mean, and even Dr. Carley has done this. Uh, he had, I don't know if he ever published it, but he definitely had some pilot data where he was doing like, he, you know, they were going around and people were doing like resistance exercises. I'm talking about like post-op, like day two, doing quads. They had bands, like not just wa walking, but, you know, to maintain muscle mass. And I think it was feasibility. I used to have a slide on it, but um, um, so I think it's feasible. Um, and of course, he, most of the design of his studies is prehab versus rehab. So the patients, the, you know, meaning the program, the exercise nutrition program was either started in the preoperative period or it was started in the postoperative period. I didn't get into all the details, but um, so that we know that patients who begin the program preoperatively were, had a higher adherence postoperatively. So they were, I think something like 70, 80% were still, uh, doing the program post-operatively, where it was more like 40 or 50% in the patients who started the program, just who didn't start it pre-op. So I think there's lots of um, opportunity for patients to, to continue uh, the program. I think what patients are missing, what we hear from patients is we're doing very well at instructing them what's going to happen in hospital, and they're missing a lot of information about what to do after they leave the hospital. Um, so anything that we can offer there, I think, again, another area very open to research because most of recovery now is going to be happening, is already happening after people leave the hospital. And that's not new. It's just that we didn't appreciate it. Um, I showed you the lap coli thing. That was a day surgery operation and recovery was longer than a month. 
Um, so I think if, if we don't know, you know, traditionally we tell patients, let's say I do hernia surgery. So we tell patients six weeks after laparotomy, six weeks till you can lift anything heavy, which is based on a zero evidence is probably dangerous because people are coming back to me in six weeks and saying, can I go back to lifting more than five pounds? I'm like, what? Yes. Uh, because even though I write it down, they're also getting information from lots of other people that you shouldn't do that. Uh, so anything we could contribute, even systematic review to start with about safe amount of physical activity after surgery, uh, I think would be very, very helpful because we're giving people wrong information. Again, de-implementation of dogma is a very useful um, strategy. Yeah. Thank you. So it sounds like patient education would definitely be a, a point to touch upon in post-operative care. Patient education, but we don't, what are we basing it on? Oh yeah, of course, systemic review followed by patient education. Yeah. Yeah. Thank great, you. thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> very stimulating uh, question period and a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Feldman. For that wonderful presentation and uh, have a wonderful day everyone thank you you too thank you very much thank you jason thanks bye, bye. thank you